Hi, I'm Sarah Lee, and joining me is my co-host, Juliana. <laughs> Sorry. And welcome to Murder Psyche Podcast, a podcast where we dive into old and new truth. Blah, blah. I hate this. <laughs> yeah, it's really echoey. I'm taking and one out. A podcast where we dive into old and new cases and try and figure out why the killers did it. We are here for you every week with a new case. And if you would like to recommend any cases, you can check out our Instagram at Murder Psyche Pod or Twitter at Murder Psyche. Also, a quick announcement, we have a YouTube channel now. <laughs> so if you would like to watch us discuss instead of hearing us, you can head over to YouTube.com and search Murder and Psyche Podcast. Warning, there are graphic descriptions of crime scenes in the episode. Viewer discretion is advised. Now let's get into the episode. So this is our first episode where we don't talk about a serial killer. Serial killers are really interesting. <laughs> the the echo. It's fine. But also side note before we start, some things I say may not be okay, I hate this echo. It's causing me to like mess up. <laughs> me too. So like uh, let's not do it. Side note, before we start, some things I may not say be completely true due to translation between Portuguese and English. Yeah, uh, I saw, I found like several articles where I was like, I know this is translated because that's not how you say that. <laughs> <laughs> but it was like, it was, like I understood what they were trying to say, but there might be a language barrier in some of the yes. information. So, this also takes place in Brazil, not America. So, surprise, surprise. Anyways, Suzanne von Richthofen was born on May 3rd, 1983 in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Suzanne lived with her mother, Maricia von Richthofen, her father, Manfred, and her younger brother, Andreas. Maricia was a well-known Brazilian psychiatrist and came from Lebanese descent. And then Manfred was a German engineer and was the director of the state company for highway development. Suzanne's parents were very wealthy with an estimated worth of $17 million. This wealth allowed them to provide the best of the best education for Suzanne and Andreas. Neighbors dis described the family as close, very intellectual, and quiet. They were never a family to throw parties. To I cannot speak today. <laughs> Suzanne was described as a happy but a shy little girl. Suzanne ended up graduating from a German high school and furthered her education at the Pontifical um, Catholic University to study law. When Suzanne turned 18, Manfred, her father, opened up an, two offshore accounts in Suzanne's name. And I believe that they were in Sweden, but I was never able to confirm that. Um, we probably can't confirm it at this point. It's probably confidential. Yeah, it probably is. But, what was I saying? <laughs> at the time, there were allegations that Manfred was embezzling money from his company. However, these allegations were never verified. Also, at the age of 18, Suzanne was so intelligent that she knew three different languages to, and took ballet classes regularly. In the summer of 1999, Suzanne started taking Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu classes. Here she would meet Daniel Cravenitos? Cravenhos? Cravenhos? It well, might be Spanish wrong. Spanish says Cravenhos. Because the age is silent. That's Portuguese. Mm -hmm. I don't. I don't speak Portuguese, but I don't speak Portuguese. If we're butchering it, but, but we speak Spanish, <laughs> and that is the closest you're gonna get. Daniel was the complete opposite of Suzanne. Daniel had grown up in a poor household, wasn't as educated, and regularly used drugs. Soon after meeting, they started dating. Initially, Suzanne's parents just ignored the relationship and thought it would pass quickly. However, they didn't know throughout the relationship, Suzanne would shower Daniel with money and expensive gifts while he exposed her to drugs. 
The parents found out about Daniel's regular use of marijuana and his refusal to get a job and a better education. So they told Suzanne of their disapproval of the relationship and the belief that Daniel was just using Suzanne for the family wealth. However, Susan dismissed their claims and started sneaking out to see Daniel. In July of 2002, Suzanne's parents went on a month-long vacation. During the vacation, Daniel moved into the house with Suzanne and Andreas. Once the parents returned, Suzanne asked if they could buy her an apartment. Suzanne had the intentions of getting the apartment and have Daniel live with her. However, Manfred told Suzanne that she could get an apartment once she earns the money to get one. Mm. Which, like, good on them. I think they were just like, we're not going to fund something we don't support. <laughs> Which, I mean, yeah. Fair enough, I would do the same. Yeah. <laughs> so, what did I say? This interaction, along with the disapproval of the relationship, caused Suzanne and her parents' relationship to become strained. One night, Suzanne and her mother got in an argument, and Mauricia gave Suzanne an ultimatum. Suzanne can continue her relationship with Daniel or continue to be financially supported by her parents. <laughs> I love my mother. This didn't sit well with Suzanne at all. So on the night of October 31st, 2002. America's Halloween. Yes. Fun fact, they don't celebrate Halloween in other places besides America. No, that's just an American thing. We're weird. Like, we were like, death? <laughs> Scaring people? Yes, um, that's for us. Because in Mexico, they celebrate the Day of the Dead. But that's more ceremonial and, like, yeah. meaningful, whereas Halloween to us is just like... <laughs> Let's scare a bunch of children. Um, boo. <laughs> Basically. Boo. boo. Okay. So on the night of October 31st, 2002, Suzanne and Andreas went to a cyber cafe to hang out with some friends. Before they left the house, Suzanne disabled the security cameras surrounding the home and the alarm system. At the cafe, Suzanne met up with Daniel and his brother, Christian. The three of them left the cafe and headed back to Suzanne's house. They drove into the garage and Suzanne walked into the home. Suzanne went upstairs to her parents' bedroom to make sure they were asleep. Once she confirmed they were asleep, she signaled to Daniel and Christian to enter the home and do the job. So Suzanne went to the home library while Daniel and Christian grabbed iron bars and put on their hoods. Jesus. I know. Am I allowed to swear? Yeah. You, we've sworn before on this podcast. Yes, but it's now on YouTube. <laughs> I don't want to get demonetized. <laughs> we'll just go, <laughs> it's just like beep, just like those long. It's a little quack sound every time we cuss. It's <laughs> just like, it's like crack. There's like a note, and it's like, Juliana, please stop swearing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, once the brothers entered the bedroom, they started bludgeoning the parents with iron bars. Despite their force, the parents didn't die quickly. The boys grabbed wet towels to drown out their screams, but this didn't help much. Daniel ended up going downstairs to the kitchen to get a jug of water to drown the parents. When Mauricio was still remained alive, their brother suffocated her with a plastic bag. Sadly, both parents faced slow, painful deaths. Once they were dead, Suzanne entered the bedroom to make sure they were dead. How do you, how do, you do that? After Suzanne... After the murders, Suzanne, Daniel, and Christian made the scene look like a burglary that gone deadly. They turned, like, they took some cash and scattered paper around. <laughs> As you can see, I had a side rant. I see the side rant. I'm like, <laughs> oh, like, no. Because I was reading it, and it's, how do you kill your parents? How do you just... I, there, I think there must be some underlying issues that we're not seeing here. I don't think that that's the only thing. Like, she just met Daniel, and that's the only thing that motivated her to kill her. I know not everyone has a great relationship with their parents, but when you have parents like hers who are trying the best they can to give you the best education and provide everything for you, 
kill them but i've been in love before okay. i will admit that i've been in love before but never once did i think while i was in love with said boy that i was gonna murder my parents to be with him well i think it's also a greed thing as well because well yeah her family was wealthy so it was, she was like i get the boy and the money but also like your parents are dead so your parents are you kidding me if i murdered my parents Norberta would not come after me because he doesn't want to come back at all as anything. <laughs> not even like a butterfly. But Celine, on the other but hand. But Celine will come back and fuck me over. She will beat my ass as a ghost. In the afterlife, you're just dead. Like you're. <laughs> no, she'll be in the afterlife. I'll be on here. And she'll just be like, You thought that was a good idea. Are you happy now? Guess who's going to die <laughs> from a ghost? And everyone's gonna think she's crazy. It's just every time something's going good in your life, Celine just like shows up and like fucks it up. I will, I will fear Celine more than I will fear anything in this world, especially if she becomes a ghost. Celine as a ghost just seems scary. Like she, she would abuse whoop, her power. She, she could whoop my ass, and I can't. She can whoop your ass now, <laughs> Celine. Celine. So once they left the house, Suzanne and Daniel had. <laughs> Hi. 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 <laughs> I like your shirt. Once they left the house, Suzanne and Daniel headed to a motel while Christian went to a fat food, fast food restaurant. They did it. How do you like just go to Mickey D's after? <laughs> <laughs> you're like, hey, guys. I'm sorry. I'm not, I'm you call up your friends. You're like, hey, I want to get some Mickey D's. And then you're like, it's two in the morning. <laughs> well, even that, you're like, ah, oh, just murdered my parents. Should go get some McDonald's. <laughs> like, I know. Like, it. I, I know I'm making, like, jokes or whatever. And I know it's, like, I'm very serious about, like, yeah, this is really bad. But also, like. <laughs> like, what? what? <laughs> I don't understand. I mean, it could be, like, they're. Yeah. yeah, this is like an alibi attempt. This is their way to forge an alibi. So they're like, I couldn't have done it. I was here with these people. And then in Suzanne and Daniel's case, they were like, we were at a motel. Doing motel things. Doing mo- <laughs> 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 All right. So around three in the morning, Suzanne and Daniel checked out of the motel and went back to the cyber cafe. At- I cannot speak. Once at the cyber cafe, Suzanne and Andreas headed back to the house and discovered the crime scene and called the police. Well, Andreas discovered it. Suzanne discovered it. Discover- Andreas what? was like, oh. And then Suzanne was like, oh. That's so sad, though. Imagine coming home and being like, my parents are dead. Yeah. Because Andreas doesn't know what's going on. No, this man was just chilling at a cyber cafe. He was like Spines. playing some Minecraft. Yeah. And then... I cannot. So, once the police arrived and heard the story given by Suzanne and Andreas, they felt like something was off. They suspected only someone close to the family would have done this because the alarm system and the security cameras were still turned off. Also, they noticed one, the paper scattered around seemed like someone had placed them around perfectly like they were careful about where they placed them two the family's valuables were left untouched and three there was a placed gun in manfred's hand i'm assuming they found the gun suspicious because when a person dies initially their body just goes completely limp so before like um i think liver mortis i think that's what it's called rigor mortis rigor mortis that's what it's called where your body stiffens up in whatever position you are. But when you immediately pass, everything goes limp. So therefore, if Manfred was trying to like defend himself with a gun, he would have dropped the gun once he passed. Yeah, most likely he would have mm-hmm. dropped it. And it like, would have been next to him, but like not in, in his, his hand. hand. Like he was still holding it. Yeah. That and if he shot it, there would be gun residue. On him. Yes. So the next day, they became suspicious of Suzanne because she was seen swimming in the home pool with Daniel and seemed oddly calm about her parents' tragic passing. 
they became even more suspicious when hours after the parents' burial, Suzanne threw a big party for her 19th birthday. Like, we're both 18. Like, this is like our age shit. Yeah, she's around our age in this. <laughs> but like... Yeah, but it's it's just so weird to me to like... You just did this horrific crime and you're like, my 19th birthday, yay! Come, bring me present. Well, imagine how her friends felt in this. I would feel so awkward as a friend. Like, if your friend was like, I know my parents just passed, but I'm throwing a big ass party. <laughs> and, like, it's also interesting because her families don't throw parties. Yeah, her family was, like, really quiet. That's what the neighbor said. So, they're like, something's up. If all of a sudden this quiet girl is throwing a big party. Suspicious, that's all I'm gonna say. Police started shadowing Suzanne and Daniel after they found out that Christian bought a new motorcycle in cash with the hundred dollar bills. Daniel's brother does not okay, out of all like the IE discovery and like shows that I've seen, like you don't if you're somehow connected to like don't. you know what I mean? Like not that I'm saying murderers be smart, but don't I'm just murder. saying <laughs> that like that's not smart. <laughs> like It's not a smart move. So, on November 9th, 2002, Suzanne, Daniel, and Christian were, arrest- were arrested and all three of them confessed to the murders. Once the media found out about the confessions, they had a field day and focused on the contrast between the brothers and um, Suzanne. The media believed that Daniel was the mastermind and Suzanne was the helpless little girl who landed in the wrong crowd. Wow. Wow. (laughs) They believed this because Daniel and Suzanne's statuses. Daniel, as well as Christian, fit this mold of these drug-addicted, poor, ugly thugs, where Suzanne was this bright, affluent, beautiful girl next door. Like, how could she have done this? The media pushed this narrative until a certain interview came out. You see, Suzanne and her lawyer were doing this interview, and before they started the interview, you can hear her lawyer tell Suzanne to start sobbing once the cameras, like, started rolling. However, the cameras had been running the whole time (laughs) and caught this, and it was aired on television thus destroying Suzanne's reputation. So on July 17, 2006, Suzanne, Daniel, and Christian were put on trial for the murders of Manfred and Mauricia and were charged with qualified homicide, which is the equivalent to first degree murder, but in Brazilian law. Suzanne had presented her defense that Daniel made her do it and she had no motives to kill her parents. Daniel knew that Suzanne adored him like a god and feared that if she didn't kill her parents, then Daniel would leave her. If that is your man's mindset, run. (laughs) Jesus. Daniel made her believe that he loved her and the only way they could be together is if the parents were out of the picture. Or so her defense says. Or so that was her defense. Saying, quote, The Kubikos family thought I was the golden goose that laid golden eggs. They wanted to keep all my money. Daniel forced me to do everything I did, end quote. The brothers presented their defense that Suzanne was the mastermind and they only did it to appease her. Daniel also presented an additional defense. What was my thing? Just dyslexic things. <laughs> dyslexic things. <laughs> um, Daniel presented an additional defense of doing it to protect Suzanne. Daniel had claimed that Manfred sexually abused Suzanne and both parents were alcoholics. However, Suzanne and Andreas denied that Suzanne was ever sexually abused by their father. Also, the autopsies found zero alcohol content at in zero alcohol content at the time of their deaths which 
Which, I mean, is possible, but, like, if they are claimed alcoholics, it's weird. Yeah. Well, it's like, if you're an alcoholic and if you are murdered, there is the possibility that there's no alcohol. Yeah, concept. it's a possibility, but, like... The likelihood is low. Yeah. And when it came time for the prosecution to de- present, they said that Suzanne was the mastermind and Daniel and Christian did it to appease Suzanne and were promised for a cut of the money. As prosecutor Robert Tardelli, I think that's what you said, mm-hmm. put it, Suzanne wanted to, quote, get her hands on the money and assess and assets her parents had worked so hard to obtain. She wanted her freedom and independence without having to work for it, end quote. Suzanne's additional motive was to get vengeance against her parents for not accepting her relationship with Daniel. One correspondent tried to explain some of Suzanne through Hannah Ardent's theory of banality of evil. The prosecution pushed for Suzanne, Daniel, and Christian to get 50 years each. During the trial, Daniel and Christian would be seen crying while Suzanne remained unemotional. At one point, Susan can even be seen laughing at Daniel and Christian for crying. That's not even their parents. Yeah, I know. Well, they're also going to jail for, like, a really long time. Yeah. Like, 40 years. But, like, it's still, like... It they showed remorse. Uh, yeah, it seems unremorseful of her. Mm-hmm. So, on July 22nd, 2006, Suzanne was sentenced to 40 years for qualified homicide. While Daniel and Christian were sentenced 38 years for conspiracy. In 2009, Suzanne attempted to appeal her sentence and change it to house arrest, but this was denied. Suzanne attempted to do this again in 2011 and was once again denied. Also in 2011, Suzanne sued Su- Andreas <laughs> sued Suzanne for half of the inheritance and the insurance policy on their parents. Luckily, Andreas ended up winning all of her inheritance and the insurance policy. In 2011, Suzanne denied her chances of parole to stay in prison with her lover at the time, Sandra Regina Gomez. Also, Daniel got married to a woman by the name of Anil. I don't know how to say that name. Aline? Aline? Maybe. Aline Bentel. In recent years, Suzanne became engaged to a man by the name of Rodrigo Elberg, but the engagement ended. Attempts to free Suzanne have been made. However, the courts believe that she's not ready to leave because of her lack of regret of like committing these crimes. Suzanne was supposed to inherit a condo from her grandmother, but this was sold away to pay off her debt. So the only money she'll be able to receive is the money in the two offshore accounts, since they're not in Brazil yeah. or a country that they have allies with. I'm assuming they can't get like a subpoena or something in their law to obtain that money. Yeah. Also, Daniel was allowed to leave prison for six months to celebrate his honeymoon. And I believe if the document, if the articles I read were correct, that Daniel and Christian were released from prison. Yeah. I think. I don't know. That, that, that could be like, that's all like, a lot of it is like, because we're not in Brazil, it's not. Well, we don't know how their law or judicial system uh, works. I know roughly how it works, but I'm not super familiar with it. They have very different laws and a lot more political unrest than we do. Well, we have political unrest, but not to the extent <laughs> that it, it occurs in Brazil, if that makes any sense. Yeah. It's also very interesting that you could leave. Like, in Brazil, they, if you're a good prisoner, they let you leave. Yeah, you can leave. It's called temporary departure. Yeah. I was telling my mom about that. She's like, what? <laughs> yeah, it's like te- a temporary just... exit or departure or something like that. Like, if I was ever in jail in Brazil... My mom could just call up the jail and be like, we need her for a quinceanera. (laughs) Yeah, you could do that. (laughs) And I can leave for a few, like a little while. Mm -hmm. Also, I would like to bring up that 
well, besides the parents, but Andreas was, like, the biggest victim in this. Yeah. Because not only were his parents married, but also his sister murdered them. Yeah. It was like he thought he can go to his sister for emotional support and no. His sister just killed me. Oh, oh God. Well, my analysis, I guess I should start. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to discuss something that Sarah brought up earlier. She talked about, um, they brought up in her trial of this, like, weird concept of um, banality of evil i think i'm saying that right if i'm not it's i already can messed it up correct so it. but like um it was uh, written in like the early um 1900s or whatever and i talked about um 1900s i don't know um but like 19 um after world war ii mm -hmm. and it talked about um nazi the nazi regime and whatever and um hannah uh, Ardent, um, she talked about how she had met a Nazi, a man who was, um, who participated in transferring Jews to concentration camps and, um, gassing them. She talked about how she found that he was not an evil person, but he committed evil things. The concept that, like, humans aren't inherently evil, but they can do evil things. Like, there's evil people and then there's like people who aren't evil but they do evil things like her theory mm. was that and um in terms of his the man that she was talking about was um adolf um eichmann i don't know eichmann i think eichmann i think um uh she made the claim that he had the inability to think um from the standpoint of like other perspectives and thinking from for about somebody else and what they what it's like to be in their shoes basically and um and therefore because he, he's not able to see from other people's perspectives he couldn't um he couldn't de decipher between right and wrong so mm -hmm. he could he didn't know that he was doing evil so that's the theory that like he's not evil but he does evil things um basically she's like he's not inherently evil but shallow and clueless drifting into directions and structures um of others without deep um, ideological beliefs in that system, if that makes any sense. So would that be a sociopath in a way? Well, that's that's what a lot of the critical the, the critics say or whatever. But the in the trial, it was used as, look, she's not evil. She just did an evil thing. Mm. If that makes any sense, they were saying she's not. Look, Suzanne, it's not evil. She just did an evil thing. If that makes sense. Like, she didn't know it was, like, she, she's not a bad person. Don't make her go to jail for so long. <laughs> she murdered they, her parents. And then they, they quoted this, um, they quoted Hannah to, to, like, prove it. And it's about Nazi. And, and her family was, like, uh, part, German. part German. And so I think that's pro probably one of the reasons they brought it in there. But it's, a lot of critics are very um, critical of her theories. Um, a lot of it say it's basically describing when you say that um, that they don't they can't look from other people's perspectives or whether they p critics are saying that like, it's like that's an inherent human capability of like having thoughts and having a conscience like that is something that is yeah, inherently you human you know the difference between right and wrong and if you don't then that's sociopathic or psychotic mm -hmm. and so they're saying that's not a reason for her to not have a long sentence, basically. You're, like, you're a sociopath, you killed someone, like you yeah. killed your parents, you don't, that's not an excuse. And a lot of people are like, um, specifically not in, to the, in the trial, but like just to Hannah's claims about um, being, doing evil things, but not being an evil person, people are very critical of saying like, um, this man that she was evaluating and basing her theories upon, like, he did have thoughts and he did perform evil deeds like genocide and rape um even if it was on behalf of the nazi regime he still did it and he was yeah. consciously there so there people are like that's not an excuse to say he wasn't evil and he wasn't a bad person so i mean as far as like say that so. goes like that's why i really believe that wasn't a good example in her trial of for um suzanne at least like because it, it just, it wasn't strong enough evidence to say, like, she didn't need the long sentence. 
because mm. it can e- easily be contradicted to be to easily contradicted to say like hey but that's an inherent inherent human behavior to see from other people's shoes to empathize or to sympathize yeah and if you can't that's sociopathic and or psychotic and you're going to jail like you know what I mean so well if you commit a crime and you don't see what's wrong with it I think you're gonna be thrown in jail yeah but that was a defense and it kind of was sucked but as far as like her psyche or whatever um the I wanted to go over like a lot of people made the argument when she made the argument in trial it was like her boyfriend was manipulative about it and um the only I did some research about like manipulation and like how you in toxic relationships or whatever and to be honest it's really indeterminate because we would have to see and evaluate and like observe the their social dynamic before the murders do you know what I mean? And how they interacted because a lot of it has to do with like um, guilting and um, forcing like, them to feel negative thoughts about themselves even if they're not doing anything wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, like was it was Daniel actually abusive and Suzanne was this victim who thought she was in love with this man? Yeah. Or what? Like was it an okay like a good relationship? And was just using the excuse. Yeah, well, I was trying to remain, like, super unbiased when I did research on it, and the only thing I could really, like, find that, like, you could probably prove in court is, like, a, a, not a symptom, but, like, a quality that you often find in abusive and manipulative relationships um, is, like, uh, the abuser will oftentimes find, try to establish a physical place where they can be more controlling and dominant over that person. Mm -hmm. And so when they got that apartment or whatever... And Daniel was supposed to stay with her. That could have been a sign mm. of being um, manipulative. And he could have, like, guilted her into being, like, oh, you're so rich and you don't have to worry about the things I have to worry about. Yeah. Or whatever. But that's, like, the only evidence I can find. And that's not necessarily – just because it's there, that doesn't necessarily mean it was manipulative in that way. Yeah. To murder. Um, so it's, like, very vague. And I, to be honest, in court, you, unless you had more evidence – you couldn't really prove anything. Well, it has to be proven within a, re- without a shadow, a shadow of a doubt. In America, but who knows what's going on in the judiciary That's system true. of Brazil? In Brazil, it can um, be. It, they do have judges or whatever, but and the judge mainly decides. But it's um, the the judge really wasn't having it. They, they were like, yeah, no, no, and she actually had like a. Um, psych evaluation like um I think during the tri- like in the middle of the trial it was like um it's called like a Warsaw test but it's basically like an ink ink block test we know where they show the pictures oh. and they're like describe what you see and <laughs> what they, was she like I saw me murdering my mother <laughs> yeah basically I mean no she probably didn't do that but it's what you see and what you describe and what pi- certain pictures make you feel is supposed to like psychologically evaluate what type of person you are and so they determined um that she was manipulative disguised narcissistic um insidious and possessing camouflaged aggression so like she was angry inside but she had a very uh stoic demeanor Mm. so very weird they also um said that she was very um she had high um egocentrism so narcissistic yeah obviously very centered around herself which i mean is common in um uh when in wealthy (laughs) families um to have kids be feel like they're all important or whatever because they grew up in a power in a power structure where they were the most important or their parents made them feel like they were they were the most important or whatever um, but her manipulation is, like, really, like, you can see her manipulative nature if you just look at how she acts. How she acts. I mean, um, there was even a prosecutor from the, from Brazil, or the, the little county or whatever, that came to, like, talk to her, and he, like, kissed her on the cheek or whatever. Like, you know how they do in the mm-hmm. cultural, culture. Yeah. And, um, I guess he made suggestive natures that um inmates had claimed that she encouraged 
but afterwards she said that she felt uncomfortable and charged him with sexual harassment. That's interesting. Which is very manipulative. So she's trying to say like, oh, the prosecution is just trying to get with me. They're abusing me or whatever. In some form or fashion. In some form or fashion. And then she was also known to change her, change her sexuality a lot to her advantage. So if she felt like being homosexual at the time was going to mm-hmm. help her the most, she was homosexual. And then she would change to straight when she needed to manipulate sexual harassment. Was there ever a possibility that she was, like, actually bisexual or pansexual in a way? Um, that she just showed one side more to help her? It's, it's possible, but um, as far as, like, doing research about it, like, the Brazilian country, Brazilian uh, countries, or, or culture, is not super familiar with that type of um, education or, like, sexuality. Mm-hmm. Cause they're very, so they, they tend to be more religious or whatever. Yeah. So, so in their eyes, it's, oh, she's changing. She's changing or whatever. But regardless, she's going back and forth. At least with like the prosecutor, or whatever. I don't believe she was actually attracted to the prosecutor. I think she was trying to be manipulative mm-hmm. during the trial or whatever. Um, but I mean, she's known to have like the best behavior in the prisons. Like she's very like the best prisoner. Like. The, yeah. They all like her. Like it's, it's whack. Um, like but that. yeah, it's whack. She's like the best, and e- like when the reports, it's always like the first chunk of like because they have to send reports to the judge, so the judge can decide whether or not she gets to like go home on house arrest or whatever. Uh-huh. And so the the first part of the report is always like staff from like the prisons or whatever, um, or like just like not high up staff, but just like staff that interact on a yeah. daily basis, and they're always like very praising of her behavior but then they're all there's a report with like the higher up authorities that are always like um very harsh on her behavior Mm -hmm. very they're they recognize she's manipulative they say um and if this is a quote or whatever they describe her as an unrecoverable prisoner um her she has psychotic behavior that's manipulative and malicious um with detainees so like other prisoners um, she's her effective um, involvement with one of the she has effective involvement with one of the most undisciplined and fear detainees so she's like she's like super nice to the point where like she's friends with everybody in the prison even some of the like worst prisoners oh so yeah because of the girl she was because it was rumored that like they had it wasn't rumored but it, they had signed a few documents to live in a, um, like they shared a cell together and it looked as if it was a marriage certificate of Brazil. Yeah. But since they're more of a, like, they're not open to same sex marriages, it wasn't recognized within. But it was like that, um, girl Gomez, she, I think, believed murdered her husband. Mm hmm. So, like, she was also someone who had murdered. And her... Whack. <laughs> Cannot Whack. be me. Um, yeah, but the, the also the authorities also criticized her, like, manipulation of, like, uh, the, the accusation of sexual harassment of the prosecutor. They were very critical of that. Mm-hmm. They were, like, inmates that they interviewed had said that she kind of encouraged it. And then guards had also said that she kind of encouraged his... Bad behavior. Bad behavior that... It wasn't even, like, bad. It was, like, just suggestive, which is kind of disgusting anyway, considering she, like, murdered her parents and is in jail and you're a prosecutor for the other side. Yeah, if their thing, if in their way of suggestive is the cheek kisses, because if someone, I'm part of a Mexican household, that's just normal. Like, I do that with family members all the time. Well, she claimed that, like, his closeness to her was uncomfortable, or something like that which i mean as a as a prosecutor you don't really want to get buddy buddy with like the murderer the, 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 in, the murderer or whatever especially if you're prosecuting them but because that could be end up turning so biased. like yeah so he he was like taken off the case or whatever but like yeah. the, i don't the judge did not go through the sexual like harassment they just dismissed it but they took him off the case okay. so like basically it was like yeah she it's it's we interviewed people, we talked to the authorities at the prison, and it was like, she encouraged it, 
but he shouldn't have done it, so. Yeah. Whatever. Don't. Um, don't try and, like, make a move on a girl who just murdered her family. Yeah, and she hasn't talked to her brother in, like, 10 to 11 years, like, at all, Andreas. I wouldn't want to talk to her either. No, I wouldn't. I totally understand. Um, Poor Andreas. But in Brazilian culture, their family structures are very family, family, family. Like, it's mm. all about family. You socialize a family. You associate with people by family. And your family doesn't like them. You don't really socialize with them. Mm. And so to not have contact with your brother for so long is, like, like – the unheard of unheard of so like like the authorities are like very critical of the fact that like she doesn't even contact her brother and that's her family and like yeah. that means a whole lot more to them than it does a lot of other issues which is interesting because for us we'd be like well yeah I, I wouldn't contact her either but to them it's like wow well i think in a latin x household because this is how i've grown up where you talk to your family and if you don't talk to your family it's like this big taboo yeah. Like, you associate with them. You're always in contact. For most parts, you live near them your entire life. Yeah. It's weird when you don't, and it's, yeah, it's just this thing where you are surrounded by them. It's just more shocking to their culture, because, like, even, even, like, murderers and inmates in the prison still talk to their families. Even if their families, like, don't associate with, like, don't. They're like, that. what you did was fucked up. Yeah, yeah, but they still talk. That's yeah. the thing. Family is, like, everything to this, this, the culture. And it's, like, wow, she doesn't even talk to her brother. Like, that's a big deal to them. And, mm-hmm. honestly, Andreas, yes, don't talk to your sister. But it's... it's She's a crazy bitch. But that's that's why a lot of them are, like, critical. That it's just, like, she's off the rails or whatever. Yeah. Um, um, also, like, the temporary departure thing. Like, she's actually been out a couple of times mm-hmm. on temporary departure on Mother's Day and Father's Day because there's no laws prohibiting that she can't celebrate that. There should be. No, like, I literally, I was confused when I read it, and so I looked it up, and, like, it's, a considered a holiday even, it's considered a holiday even if they don't, like, close businesses. It's considered it, and they can't prohibit inmates from celebrating it. So she can just get out on Mother's Day or Father's Day if she wants. That, okay... I think there should be a law just you know, for I, her. I was like, I was like, what? And so she's on temporary departure. I mean, they know where she is, but like, she yeah, has to I'm come sure back. They, she has to come I'm back. I'm sure they put like a tracker on her somewhere or have people with like yeah, shadow yeah. her to watch where she's But doing. she can go wherever she wants. She's seen like getting ice cream, like picking flowers that, with I don't like her, that. like she, her before she broke up with her um, fiance, fiance or whatever. Yeah. She's like seen doing normal people shit on mother's day and father's day no and i was like yo that's that's weird i that that actually makes me upset because it's like you murdered your mother and father and now you're like well i want to go out on mother's day or father's day yeah and i read out loud there should be a law just against her (laughs) specifically her (laughs) if i'm ever in the brazilian judicial system make a law against her well like it's even weirder because like she talks about getting out a lot and she she's still in contact with her friends like it's weird like she still talks to her friends I and and they it. like they have combos about like she talks about like if she gets out she wants to have like an anonymous life and get a husband or whatever and have kids and i'm like that's a natural thing to want but i think it's like after it's like you, you show- murdered your parents you're in jail and she's just like i need to get out soon um so i'm appealing to the court also i want kids and i'm like oh my god it's just it's just so strange to me it is i i i can't oh and also this is kind of random and i'm basically done with my evaluation but she was dating her lawyer (laughs) she was dating her lawyer during the trial I like, thought her and Daniel were still together. I thought they had, like, broken up sometime before the Gomez girl. No. She was seeing... She, she had sexual relations with her lawyer. So immediately um, once they're caught, she leaves them, guy. Yeah, no, like, literally she, after she went to prison... She didn't talk to him anymore. She broke up with him. Like, in prison. She was like, yeah, no. And I was like, Well, even before yo, she went to jail, because if she's having these 
sexual relations with her lawyer, then that means they might have been broken. No, they up. talked in prison though. Like there, there were records of like he, she broke up with him in prison because he used to visit her all the time, even when she was in jail, and then he stopped. That's how they knew they broke up. Wait, her and the lawyer, or her and Daniel? Her and the lawyer. Like I was like, I was like, cause cause this one person did like a whole like evaluation on it, and I was like. They, they were an American um, student that, like, went to Brazil and was, like, studying criminology. And they did, like, a report on it. And I was like, yes, thank you. But, like, it was really weird. Because I was, like, she was seeing her lawyer. During the trial. And during after the, the trial, trial. And after the trial. No. And then, like, broke up with him in prison. Like, that's so weird. I, I'm, like, I was, if that doesn't show her manipulation, No, then. that's what I'm saying. She's so manipulative to the point that she just went that far. She slept with her lawyer, and then once he did what she want, like, once he failed what she wanted him to do, she was like, bye-bye. You failed me, so I'm, I'm not going to be sleeping girl. with you anymore. <laughs> Basically. No. <laughs> Can't get behind it. Like, you do you with what you want. Like, if you want to sleep around with people, you do that as long as you respect She's yourself. She's in prison. But to sleep with your lawyer so that you can hope that he presents a good, like, defense for you. And then you break up with him as soon as that defense fails. That's a no for me. <laughs> it's just manipulative. And it's weird. And it's like the amount of like the inmates describe her as getting around like she's yeah she's been engaged she's had relations with her lawyer she like but that's not all the she goes on dates in prison like she has that's interesting like actually. she still has a very active like love life and i'm like oh. bro like my brain was like whoa like what do brazilian prisons be like like i was like well you can do that in American prisons yeah, as well, but, but it's, it's like, like there's still there's like guards present and you can only do it in the prison. Yeah, it's just so strange to me. It's so strange to me. <laughs> I it I was like reading about it and I was like, whoa, like okay. She's Love life down. early. She's like, I'm still young and I'm like okay, murderer. She's in her thirties ish. She's now. still trying to get out of prison. Like I'm actually kind of like she probably like if her if her family if her brother didn't take the money she could probably be out of prison right now yeah like if her brother didn't sue her for money like she could have used that mm -hmm. which is like but now she has the only money she has left is in two offshore which she accounts. can't access in jail yeah she can only access once she leaves jail which is good because like yeah that's why she wants to be on house arrest though I can't. <laughs> That's why the judge was like, yeah, no. Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. You're, You're going to go to your offshore accounts 100% and then pay off somebody to let you. Because Brazil's, I mean, I hate to be critical, but yeah, they're corrupt. <laughs> but like, yeah, you could easily. Most governments are. <laughs> most governments have a level of corruption. And like. If we haven't realized that from the series of events. Series of unfortunate <laughs> events. Um. But yeah, that is my evaluation and quite an interesting that was very topic. Interesting. So if you would like to check out anything we discussed today, you can check out our Instagram and Twitter. Over there will be our sources, photos, and additional material. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> Have a lovely rest of your day. Stay safe and we will see you next time.